real giving is is more than the golden rule, which is give to the level that you would feel given to and loved by. It actually goes beyond to give to what's important to the other, whether they agree. You can agree with it or not. Hey, you're listening to the Blessed Couple Podcast, where we talk about how to do this marriage thing and experience God in the process. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Let's get started. So we thought we would start with something of an overview of our life. Betsy and I were married in 1970 in Korea, part of the three sevens couples. At the time, I was the president of the church and living in Washington, D.C. After 40 days, Betsy, who at that time was living in New York City and was the center director there, came to Washington. We started our life together. I was not only the president of the church, but also Betsy and I, when she came, became center directors at Upshur Street in Washington, D.C., where 40 other members were then residing. So we were in a situation where we had to start to work out our marriage relationship in the context of my seeking to serve as a president of the church as well as a center director, and Betsy is a co-center director. It was a very tumultuous beginning to our marriage because of the pressures that we felt from the mission side along with the demands of trying to figure out how a husband and wife related and understood each other and remained peaceful with each other. And remaining peaceful is not what we did. Very difficult time, kind of shocking time, I think, for both of us, for me to be encounter something I never experienced before and from a type of person I never had encountered before. And the same for Betsy. So after a couple of years, by God's wonderful grace, two parents came and uh, sent Betsy and, and four other married women out as IWs. That gave us a break from each other. And uh, over the next couple of years when she was traveling, we somehow came to a greater degree of maturity and our marriage settled down, at least in part, from there. Also as part of our history, uh, we thought we would tell you something of two stories about the lows and the highs of our, of our marriage. In the early 1980s, we went back to my hometown, which was in Troy, New York, right near Albany. And uh, working there, living there, my family remnants were still there. My father was still alive. I have an older brother who was married and he had his family. And it came to the point where Betsy began to feel extremely uncomfortable with interactions either with my family or that she felt were you know, promoted by my family members. And I think she felt like they were trying to undermine our marriage and force her to, to drive her out so to speak. And I had a very different perception of them. I just did not think that was what they were about. So this uh, very difficult phase of our life emerged where our perceptions were uh, of what was happening was, were so different and so rife with tension producing encounters. And this went on for uh, months. I finally came to the point where I felt like I had to say nothing. And uh, ultimately, we were able to simmer it down to the point where we could agree to disagree. And that's still where we are with that dimension of our experience. The difficulty of it has greatly receded. But I guess the point I want to make is this is in the early 80s to mid 80s, probably. So roughly 12 to 15 years after our marriage. So, and that was just a real rocky time that came to us, but we got through it. And we'll talk more probably about the tools and things we use over, overall to get through it. On the other side, just a very simple experience we had when we celebrated this past October, our 45th wedding anniversary, we decided to make it a special day for ourselves. So we, we know a husband and wife here in Kona, Hawaii, who, offer, they have a massage therapy studio. So we went and each got a very nice 90-minute uh, massage from I from the husband, Betsy from the wife. And then we went out to this beautiful resort in Hawaii and just had lunch, you know, at this restaurant that we love. Uh, it's right on the beach overlooking the ocean. And uh, had a great lunch and, and for a period of time we just sat there quietly 
and uh, enjoyed each other's company. We weren't saying anything, just being together and looking at the waves and the sun on the waves. It was a really blessed moment in the silence and just a very rich and kind of sacred day for us. So anyway, that's uh, something of our history and something of the highs and the lows. And, you know, most of the time we spend somewhere in the middle between those. So that's some background. Now, one of the points that I want to make that I feel very strongly about is what is here on the screen, that continuing work on ourselves in relation to the first blessing is fundamental to having success in the second blessing. So, you know, the divine principle model of working to the formation and growth stage before marriage and then having further stages to work through after marriage. So, you know, part of that is continuing to work within ourselves, continuing to work on our relationship with God. I believe that I'm still growing in that relationship, still coming to understand more in that vertical connection, still realizing about how, ways in which God is working in my life. So we have the notion of the God-centered marriage. I think that's very key to achieving success in our marriage. That is the keeping the focus on God. Part of uh, things that I have found helpful in this first blessing process, I'll go through a, a number of them. First of all, when I was in my 30s, I did a lot of therapy. I was working out stuff from my childhood, identifying childhood wounds, becoming aware of them, seeing how they played into the reality of my life then. That was a period of time. I haven't done therapy in a long time, but I learned tools through doing therapy that have been helpful throughout my life. Journaling has been very useful for me, especially because I'm, as many men are, not very sensitive to my feelings and often knowing not what I'm feeling, in contrast to Betsy, who often knows very well what she's feeling. And so I, I have to often dig my feelings out and to kind of bring them to the surface to understand what it is often that's bothering me or that I'm angry about or that I'm hurt about. And so journaling has been very helpful. Uh, over recent years, I have adopted a meditation practice. It's a meditation practice that comes out of the Christian traditions called centering prayer that I feel called to by God and in my relationship with him. That's another tool that I think has been very useful for me in, times, in terms of continued healing and continued kind of openness and sensitive to the presence of God and and true parents in my life. So those are some things about the first blessing. And now, not to take too long, I'm going to turn it over to Betsy. Okay. Just in response to what Farley said, I remember when we went to Korea for the blessing, at some point, Father invited us to go somewhere in a car. So I remember I was in the front seat with the driver and Farley and Father were in the back seat. And at some point, Father started laughing and he said, good restoration partners, meaning Farley and I had something to restore. And of course, I'm from an Irish background. <laughs> He's from an English-Irish background. And I really believe some of the suffering we go through in our marriages is also related to that point. We have something that's behind us that we have no awareness of it, but we walk through a certain course to restore certain things. And I know when we came from being up to Albany, where Farley's hometown is, I believe to restore something that had been there, which was his parents were divorced after 11 years of marriage. And somehow we walked into something that felt bigger than us. And, you know, I remember going up there thinking, oh, we are going to bring God's love. We are going to bring so much to them. And yet I wasn't ready for some of the spiritual challenges there. And I think because of the tools that we were given, I really searched for a way out of my difficulty because I was committed to this blessing. And I remember going myself to a therapist and saying, you know, this is happening and that happened. And luckily the therapist said, have compassion for them. 
you know, instead of this feeling of maybe revenge that I was building in my heart, I gained something through searching through prayer and how to be in this kind of situation. When Farley would walk out of the room, some people would say things to me, even take the five children and leave, something like that. I was trying to explain that and overcome my feeling that maybe blood is thicker than water. Maybe this whole thing is, we can't really hear each other because it's too threatening. I'm saying things about people that are loving him so much. And so we, you know, as Farley said, it was, uh, I'm so grateful that we got through that challenge and I'm so grateful for the foundation that we had before we faced those challenges. And I believe now after 45 years, what we had to restore is more clear to us, me as an individual, my ancestry, Harley as an individual, his ancestry, and together there are many things I believe we had to restore. So that's just something to keep in mind. I wanted to share the next slide, which is really a very life-saving principle in our marriage and in my life, because in two instances, I really felt this experience where I had to love my enemy, and it's really continued throughout my life, this theme. It doesn't mean that I didn't create the enemies. It just means <laughs> that this developed. And I remember when we were with Father in classes before the blessing, he kept walking back and forth and saying, love your enemy, love your enemy. Your enemy will be your mate. And we're like looking at each other. Who is he talking about? We don't feel that. But as Farley said, when we came back to this Upshur house and there were 40 people to attend to and Farley was definitely in a vertical mode and although I had been a more vertical person when I was in New York when I came to Washington I was like where is our time together I started to go back to wanting a traditional type of marriage where we'd spend more time and it was hard for me to get through that that period of time but I kept thinking love my enemy love my enemy and so I bought a book called The Intimate Enemy and I read it and it said to Farley, can we do this exercise? And the exercise was we had to walk toward each other and say, stop when you're comfortable. And I realized Farley came within about two feet of me and he said, stop, don't come any further. And I thought, whoa, he's very different. Whereas I probably walked up to his nose and I said, this is where I'm comfortable. And so I realized we were so different based on our backgrounds. My mother used to sit around at the kitchen table, talk to me for a long time about anything. And I was just expecting so much of that kind of time together. And he was needing a lot of time, particularly because of his mission. So just that exercise alone of reading a book and trying to inherit some insight into this differences that we had was very important for us. The next slide, please. This is a precious picture for us because this was after a period of time when we had separated as a family. and. Although Farley said it was a real blessing, we had time to grow individually again. It was a first the, separation. First, sep yeah. And then this was another period of time when we were apart. And at that time, we had the three children, and we came to see Father at Barrytown, and he actually gave a name to our third child. And it was just a beautiful thing to think that the pattern that we learned from Father as our teacher and true parents as modeling true love together was that, that we could walk a public way and that would actually help us and help our marriage. He taught us that if we walked a more public way that God would be attracted to us individually and as a couple. And we experienced that, especially after that period, that condition. We were never the same in terms of, you know, we could somehow feel God's support for our marriage even though it got more difficult later, but we had that. And uh, and I think to the present day, we're never comfortable just totally being ourselves and our family without some work that we can do. Even now I live in Hawaii, so I volunteer at a local palace and try to you know, be a contributing person in the community as well as anything I can do for others in my neighborhood or other places. And I think that has been a lifesaver for us. Hey, if you're getting something good from this episode, it would mean the world to us if you could share it with someone you love or leave a five-star review because the only way this podcast spreads around is through word of mouth. 
So a share or a review would go a long way and it only takes like 10 seconds to do. Thanks, back to the show. And another aspect is for us has been to tell each other when we feel loved, how we feel loved. There's a book by Gary Chapman called Love Languages, many of you know. So we did this little exercise, and I'll do it first. I feel cared about when you spend time with me. And that was very important that Farley knew that I'm a quality time person. You spend time with me, you give me a lot of attention. I feel loved. And then he he said, well, I mean, the point of the book is that, is that people have different love languages. For those who don't know, maybe most of you do know, but for those who don't know, that we, people have different love languages. And you've got to understand what your partner's love language is and speak that language, not some other language. So Betsy's love, and they're different. We all have probably more than one love language, but the question is what is the primary love language? Betsy, for her, it's quality time. If I spend quality time with her. For me, Betsy, it's physical touch. Okay. <laughs> Somehow physical touch just does it for me. You know, I feel very reassured or cared about. Cared about when Betsy touches me, whether it be taking my hand or walking to place or putting her, her hand on my arm. It's just my love language. So important to explore that with your partners if you haven't already and not be speaking a language that your partner doesn't understand. Or often people speak their own love language to others, and one of mine is gift giving. You have a primary language and other languages that are listed in the book, but I can remember when we were first married, I gave Farley a Irish knit sweater, which I saved for and thought it would be so special. And he looked at me and he looked at the sweater and said, do you want an Irish knit sweater? And I'm like, wait a minute, maybe I do, you know? I mean, I felt like I was, trying to speak my language of love to him, and he just didn't feel it. And I remember taking that Irish knit sweater back and thinking, that's not it. You know, I got to find what his language is and practice it. So that's, that was very important for us and still is. Next slide. This is another aspect that I feel is important, and I'll try to sum up the next few things, but real giving is, is more than the golden rule, which is give to the level that you would feel given to and loved by. It actually goes beyond to give to what's important to the other, whether they agree, you can agree with it or not. So it's a higher level of giving and it's kind of an injection of hope when you do it. I can remember one time I wanted to try a horseback riding experience and Farley's allergic to horses, but I can still remember him wearing a mask and maybe taking a Benadryl, I don't remember, but because his eyes would blur up. But I looked at him and I thought, I guess he really does love me. He's willing to do this kind of experience when it, that was not something he would like or ever choose. Next slide. And this is a, another point in, along these lines that we often need something from our partners. They're the least capable of giving and growth requires both partners to stretch and when we went to a Harville Hendricks seminar one time, we saw the lecturer explain that his wife needed somebody to really hug her a lot because she never got that kind of physical touch. And he said he grew up from missionary parents who, although she was asking for hugs, they didn't hug him. And so he was like showing us his arms would only go around this far. And then he had to stretch himself to get that further and further. So this whole idea of stretching is really related to the first blessing because we're all meant to be quite more developed. We have our partner to stretch for and become those people. Next slide. This is a point Farley will talk a little bit about and then I'll finish with it. I'll finish a point about it. But it's there's some terms here called hailstorm and turtle. And in our relationship, I'm definitely the hailstorm. Farley is definitely the turtle. Well, we just came across this kind of analogy or metaphor. It was helpful to me to realize that what I sometimes experienced from Betsy was not unique to me, that there can be someone in the partnership who represents a hailstorm with a lot of emotion and a lot of aggressive energy toward relationship, a lot of energy toward connection, and that's Betsy. 
And what I realized is, okay, so what we go, have going on in our marriage is somewhat characteristic of marriages. And I'm the turtle. I do tend to retreat within myself and uh, more internal. So my task is accepting the hailstorm and letting it be, recognizing that's just part of who Betsy is and seeing the value in that, appreciating that because underlying it is this desire for connection. And of course, Betsy's task is, as this slide says, to coax out the turtle to get me perhaps to talk more or in the relationship more fully than I sometimes am. So just a way of thinking, I think what we've experienced are probably characteristic of some of your experiences. So it's just a way to think about it. But in a larger way, differences characterize every relationship, as you know. And in this context, again, drawing on Harville Hendricks, who's a very well-known marriage educator, and his wife, Helen Hunt, I think. Mm -hmm. the, in one of their books, they're talking about Martin Buber's concept of explain that the way Buber writes that phrase is I hyphen thou. And they make the point that it's not an I thou where the I and the thou are overlapping or mixed in with each other. And it's not a way of writing it where there's no connection between the I and the thou, but rather there is a hyphen. And the point from Harville Hendricks is that the task of marriage is to create an enduring hyphen, an enduring connection. And that's what everybody most deeply seeks is a sense of connection, both on a vertical level and on a horizontal level. So the task then is to negotiate the differences, to understand that differences are part of every relationship and the differences are not the problem. It's how you communicate about the differences, how you address them, and the ideal is you address them in a constructive way that allows the hyphen to be created. And we'll talk more about that if we have time. Next slide. So I think the point here is that We've been in both situations where if I see Farley withdrawing, there's a dynamic there. And if I keep doing the hailstorm thing, he's going to go further. Whereas advice to the hailstorm person is to be the stop and be the kind of person that is safe enough for that person to quiet enough for him to talk to. On the other hand, if I'm trying to be understood and, and, and I don't feel there's enough response, then I will escalate more. And if he looks at me and says, tell me what's going on and really listens and paraphrases back what the hailstorm says or what I said, then that's a really helpful thing. Can we have the next slide, please? This is called the couples dialogue and many of you are familiar with it. It's a structured way of talking. Its emphasis is on how you say things to each other will make a difference. And I think we found if we could say one thing, we have used this whether we're buying a lawnmower and we had different ideas of what we should spend and we're starting to have a little difficulty right in front of the salesman and <laughs> that has happened to us. And then we stopped and we did this dialogue till we could understand. Not, what... not in front of the salesman. <laughs> but this has been very helpful to us and I, I think we could spend a two hour seminar explaining this, but I think what we were just going to do was explain that there are, in the next slide, you can see different skills involved here to speak to each other in a structured way. And this usually takes somebody saying, if I'm upset, I'll say, Farley, can we have a dialogue now? And he might say, not now, but six o'clock tonight. And then we agree not to talk when we're upset. But if we agree, then we both agree to show up for that time and one of, we decide who's going to speak and who's going to listen and the person who speaks will do present a positive thing about the other person and then say for instance I know you're a good provider and you've tried to take care of our finances but when you get mad at me about buying a lamp I feel upset not too long and always started with the positive. And then he would paraphrase that and listen and just paraphrase and not, not react. No, so, no judgment. No judgment. 
no, no disagreement when you're mirroring. You may all know this, but if you don't know it, very important skill to incorporate in your relationship capacity to learn to communicate safely and the couples dialogue which is promoted by everyone who teaches relationship education is a very important thing to learn and by the way on that point Betsy and I have been to many workshops over the years that it has been you know related to marriage enrichment relationship education it's been invaluable very helpful and in the next skill that we recommend is that the person listening makes sense and says you make sense and validates this or I know you did a good job and you're trying to bring for me anyway a, a nice lamp into our family or something validating the other person's point of view and the third slide the next slide will just show the most important skill I think and this goes a long way to give empathy and this creates a tremendous feeling of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and really, what do you call it, um, feeling emotionally the pain and even saying, if Farley were listening to me, he'd say, well, it sounds like you really felt hurt when I didn't like the lamp that you brought home. And so because he's listening so well to me after four or five exchanges, it's very nice if the speaker can end with, thank you for taking such care and listening to me. So these, this is all written down in books and you can read more and we'd like to talk more about it, but we just want to have time for questions and answers. So we'll just show you two quick more slides. This has been such a joy for us. We came to a point where there's still many things in our family that needed to be solved and along came God's plan for us to become grandparents, which gave a real joy. And we just want to hold that out, that model Father gave, three generations, you know, us representing the past, our children representing the present, and our grandchildren representing the future, and it's such a great blessing. And the final slide is a picture of our family as it is today, with all God's interventions to keep us together, and probably will share a final remark. Well, this is a picture, our second born child was blessed in uh, 19, whenever it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but she's remarried. This is her wedding a year and a half ago now. And this is our family with children and grandchildren and Betsy's sister over on the right side of the picture. But what I wanted to say about is this. We have the notion of, of a God-centered marriage. Turning it around, I believe we have a marriage-centered God that God is very interested in our marriages and is actively supporting our relationships, our growth in love, and extending God's self to support the marriage relationship, to lead people to marriage, to help them grow in their marriage and nurture their marriage. And we might say, that that's my experience, that God has been very present when we needed that presence in our relationship. And my deeper belief is that God is interested in the love between a husband and wife and between parents and children and, you know, in the four realms of heart because that's where God finds home. God dwells in our marriage relationship and in the love we share with our spouses and within our families. So I think we can count on that. That is count on God's support and involvement in working out your marriage and making progress in your love. The final point is that all this takes time. That's how I've been married now, 45 years. Our love has grown over those 45 years. It has deepened very much so, but it's a matter of time. So if you're still you know, starting out on this journey, be patient and just try to live your life in a principled way and know that it's moving toward a very rich destiny. That's it. Anything else? So just that when I look at this picture, I thank you that God sustained us, two parents taught us the way, because we have five children and they have two parents that love each other. And that's what we could be our legacy for them and our hope for them. And we also have eight grandchildren who look to us for that too at the core. And so we're very grateful. 
Hey, if you want to improve your relationship or take your sex life to the next level, well, you're in luck because more than 70% of couples that take our Love and Integrity course said that the quality of their sexual relationship improved after joining the course. Sounds good? You can join the program today with your spouse or just take the course by yourself at loveandintegrity.com. See you in the next episode.